the strategic network of the River Thames and all the waterways that cover London. But we're not going to go straight into that because we're going to go through the business first. And I'd like to ask Ozu to take us through the agenda. We just get through that, those business arrangements. Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies for absence of being received from Assembly Member Devnish, for whom Assembly Member Hall will be substituting, and from Assembly Member Shah. Can I just ask members declarations of interest um, <coughs> to note the list of offices held by Assembly Members? And do members have any additional declarations of interest? No. no. And can I ask the committee to agree the minutes of the meetings of the planning committee held on the 22nd of January and 30th of January 2018 and to be signed by the chair as a correct record? Agreed. Summary list of actions. Can members note the ongoing and completed actions highlighted on agenda item four? Thank you. Well, I'm just going to move forward to item six. This is the Planning Committee Work Programme for 2018-2019. Can members please note the report setting out the schedule of its provisional meetings for 2018 and 19, which is subject to agreement at the annual meeting of the London Assembly on the 10th of May 2018. And can members delegate authority to the Chair in consultation with the Deputy Chair to agree the topic, terms of reference, and scope for the committee's first provisional meeting of the 2018-19 assembly year on the 27th of June, 2018. And can members also ask, also delegate authority to the chair in consultation with the deputy chairman to agree the rapporteur report on the investigation into the effectiveness and economic viability of requiring automatic water suppression system in all London buildings. Agreed. And then date of the next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday the 27th of June 2018 at 10am, but it's subject to confirmation of the London Assembly's calendar of meetings at its <coughs> annual meeting on the 10th of May 2018. And now back to the main agenda item, which is the Draft London Plan 2017 issues for the examination in public. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ozu. Right, so, <clears throat> as Ozu has said, today, and as I said at the beginning, today we're going to look, we're going to have two panels, and we're going to take an hour and a quarter on each panel, and we're looking in the first panel at our relationships, London's relationships with the wider South East, and the second panel will be looking at London's waterways and the River Thames. We have two crack groups of experts, to help us with this. We have GLA staff to also answer questions on this, on, on aspects of the London plan. And the whole point is for us to gather evidence in advance of the examination in public of the London plan, which we've already responded to, as the consultation ended last week, but this is gathering further evidence. So without more ado, I'd like our panel to introduce themselves if you could start over there. And if you just say a couple of lines, just a couple of lines, really, about who you are, so we just get it straight. I'm Martin Simmons. Um, I have uh, 50 years uh, experience of regional and strategic planning in London and the South East. I think that's why I'm here, essentially. Although I am now uh, uh, officially uh, in retirement. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Corinne Swain, uh, former Head of Planning and now a Fellow at the Consultancy Arab. Uh, I was a member of the Outer London Commission and before that uh, I was an Examination in Public uh, Panel Chair uh, during uh, the time when England had a regional planning system. I'm Ben Corr, I'm Demography Manager at the Greater London Authority. Uh, I am responsible for demographic projections for the organisation. I sit on a number of uh, expert panels for ONS on household projections, national population projections and so forth. I'm Darren Richards, I'm head of the London Plan team at the GLA, so I manage the London Plan process as we move towards uh, EIP and publication. 
I'm Jaron Peter, Senior Strategic Planner in the London Plan Team at the GLA, and um, I'm, amongst other um, topics, responsible for wider southeast and waterways. Thank you. Okay. So we don't have Bolton Land Fund. We the second panel, of course. Yeah, yes. So that's all right. Sorry, yes, I forgot. Of course, the second panel. Right. Okay. So if I kick off then. And my, my first question will be really, I think, to, to, to Darren, which is what is the underlying approach of the mayor to, um, to the wider southeast? In particular, I just want us to home in just on this part that I'm going to say now, which is on the sort of the mechanisms for collaboration and for identifying the formal arrangements, really, for identifying um, the growth locations and for identifying relationships with the wider southeast. Okay, thank you, Chair. I will um, start off with an introduction and then Jörn will, will come in with some detail um, at the end. So in terms of our collaboration arrangements, we've set up wider southeast arrangements at officer and political level, and they've been established over the last few years. So that includes an annual summit, uh, and the last summit in January um, was attended by the Mayor, a political steering group, which meets regularly, and to support that, an officer working group. Um, and that is made up of all the um, representatives from all the authorities in the wider southeast. We also have um, our duty to cooperate responses with the local plans outside of London. So they are um, they have a duty to uh, consult with the mayor for their local plans, and as part of that, we respond to their consultations, pointing out issues of, of common interest. Uh, as you'll know, to support the London Plan, we produced a strategic housing market assessment and a strategic housing land availability assessment, which project London's need, housing needs and supply. Uh, and that includes demographic and employment projections. And whilst those documents limit them to London, obviously there are interrelationships with the wider South East, and that's why uh, Ben Core here can go into more detail around the projections that underpin those assessments. Um, and because the um, London Plan uh, does seek to accommodate the majority of London's needs within London, Obviously, that hides within the assessment flows of migration between London, uh, between the, London and the wider southeast, and London and the rest of the country, and internationally. So, given the pressures for growth um, and the barriers to housing delivery that need to work, be, be overcome, um, the mayor has considered it prudent to think about long term contingencies, and that's why he's been interested in working with willing partners beyond London um, with the potential to accommodate more growth in sustainable locations outside the capital. So that partnership work could help deliver more homes, it could address housing affordability, and it would improve economic opportunities outside London. The focus is on locations that either are or plan to be well connected by public transport, and where development can help meet local growth aspirations as well as wider requirements. And this recognises that investment in public transport can often bring substantial significant benefits to wider areas. So these partnerships could focus on optimising rail capacity between London, the wider region and beyond, or the proposals for new garden villages and garden towns um, that have good links to London. So the Mayor is investigating these options and would like to secure mutually beneficial infrastructure funding to unlock these opportunities. Now these are at very early stages. We haven't got, at the moment, details of those. We're still collaborating, working with boroughs outside London. Um, and we set that as a, an aim and that the Mayor will support this. And the, the start of that is in the London Plan you've seen there are a series of transport um, investment corridors, which we've agreed with the wider southeast, um, which is where we want to work together with uh, the authorities in the wider southeast to lobby government for investment in those infrastructure corridors, because they are critical to unlocking existing growth in those corridors. So often they're holding back existing permissions and allocations in the wider southeast and in London, but they also uh, could potentially generate additional housing. Um, so that means we're open to those conversations with interested partners. And it's also part of our looking at the local plans for boroughs beyond London. So we are looking at identifying authorities with strategic longer term ambitions for growth that might be above local need or where strategic transport capacity increases are being considered. And we will welcome bilateral meetings with groups of authorities. Um, so currently, for example, we're discussing with South Essex authorities who have come together to think about how they might manage growth um, sub-regionally. Um, and as I said, there's also our duty to cooperate with the local plans. So we're working at the moment at the regional level with SEEK, um, which is South East England Councils, East of England Local Government Association, and other stakeholders um, to take forward um, those growth opportunities. Mm. And when you say you're looking, you're looking for longer term, for strategic opportunities for more housing in the rest of the South East, 
How long a term is that? It could potentially be beyond the 10 years we're thinking about here. And I think we have to recognise that for some of these developments, um, they take a long time to come forward. Mm -hmm. They might be reliant on infrastructure that um, will not be in place for a number of years. So a good example would be Crossrail 2, which is likely to be op not operational until 2033. So we're likely that any development that is supported by Crossrail 2, and it's part of the business case, is that it does bring forward additional development. Mm -hmm. But that's not likely to occur until probably the late 2020s, early 2030s. So it is linked to when we think the additional infrastructure would be invested and, and you know, the, the, those transport schemes um, would be completed and, and would be operational. Mm. Thank you. I'm not, there's, a <clears throat> there's a lot we could pick up from from that, but I think some of the later questions will pick up on almost everything you've said. That I would like to ask Ben about the, um, because you've been looking at all the demographics, haven't you, and the Shema and the Shla, just to ask you, about the, the underlying approach in terms of demographic, demographic and economic projections to outflows and inflows from the rest of the South East? Okay. Uh, the, I, there's a limit to what I can say about the economic projections. They're conducted by specialists in GLA economics, um, but I can't talk about the demographic projections uh, at length. Um, the fundamental approach we take is very similar to that used by Office for National Statistics and uh, DCLG, as were, when they undertook household projections. Um, we, we start from a, a base population, which is 2011, uh, on the grounds it's the best picture we have of population uh, linked to the census. And then we use what is known as a cohort component approach, um, which simply put, takes that starting population and rolls forward one year at a time, accounting for <coughs> patterns of migration, fertility, and mortality. Um, and we keep rolling one year forward at a time, um, taking those factors into account um, until we get to our target year of 2041 in this case. Uh, the model that we have is very uh, large and sophisticated these days. Um, it models explicitly the flows between every local authority uh, in England uh, by single year of age and gender. Um, so a very large model producing lots of data, um, but it's effectively it just mecha mechanically looks at what happened in the past and applies that going forwards. The household projection. Can I just can I yeah. just say, Joe, your line, your curve, goes is going on, isn't it? Beyond forty one, you're on a. We run to twenty fifty, uh, currently right. to support um, primarily infrastructure work such as what 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 the needs of, of TfL are and for the. Um, London Infrastructure Plan uh, as well, which was, if that's still the name, I can never quite remember, um, that was produced several years ago. Yes, 2050 is our horizon. Mm. So these projections, but they are literally just projections? They right? are projections, so they're explicitly I not forecast. I to say forecast. that caveat, <laughs> Yes. you could go on, so, so you had absurd and you know, just oh, go on and on. Yes, uh, and there's a limit to... to to what, how you should look at and interpret <coughs> those projections and how much you should treat them as a, a prediction of the future. They are very much a what if, it's what if the patterns we've seen in the past continue into the future. So obviously baked into that you have many assumptions about the population will only increase uh, up to a certain point if housing is put in place and such as that. And it's, uh, the projections attempt to be entirely agnostic uh, about that. So these are explicitly don't include factors such as housing um, because we couldn't use projections that were based on assumed housing supply as a basis for how many houses we should deliver. Um, does that make sense? There is a question a bit later on about the, about the sort of the outflow. But um, if you could just give us a sort of bit of a flavour about the people who are coming into London and going out of London. Yes, so um, I mean, London is a particularly interesting case as a demographer. Um, it is characterised by very strong, uh, very large uh, migration flows, both in and out. Um, the net balance of those is, is relatively small in terms of absolute numbers, but the characteristics of the ins and the outflows and the differences between them is what gives London its, a lot of its character. So what we see is inflows to London... Um, are, include a very high number of people in their 20s, um, especially. And outflows include uh, more people in their 30s. 
say. So London is a net importer of people in their 20s and a net exporter of every other age group. Um, people come here for opportunities of work and education, spend time, and a number of years later, there's a pattern of outward movement, either from central London to outer London, outer London to the home counties beyond. One of the burgeoning areas, I'd just like to explore this, one of the burgeoning areas of growth in London is one to four-year-olds. Um, how does that square with... Uh, I would say at the moment, uh, it has been an area of growth. It's not an area we're projecting continued growth one to four year olds. We saw a lot of growth between 2002 and 2012 where the birth rate went up from about 100,000 a year in London to 130 something thousand a year, so 30% increase in, in number of births. That number peaked in 2012 and has fallen modestly since. So we are now at peak one to four year olds about now. Um, we, what we're seeing is, is that large group moving through the age bands now so we expect a lot of growth in 11s to 15s over the next five years for example but one to four there's there's little um, to suggest that that number is going to rise significantly from this point right okay thank you uh, anyone else want to i think unless you've got anything else to say we'll move on from the questions no that's um, so Perhaps I can come in now. Um, where are the, <coughs> I think to everybody, where are the, the likely growth locations in the wider southeast? And what evidence is there of a strategic approach and uh, sufficient funding to manage sustainable growth there? So, where are the locations of the future? The obvious ones are around, obviously there's the, the Oxford Cambridge Arc, which you know the Government and the National Infrastructure Commission is focused on as being one, one place of growth, particularly because it's uh, focused around economic growth. So I think in terms of whether it's sustainable, I think that, that link between economic and housing growth is quite important. Um, the other one um, would be around some of the work with the, the bids around new garden villages and garden towns. So there are some authorities in Essex, as I, as I mentioned, authorities in South Essex are working together thinking about how their authorities can um, manage the growth in that area. Uh, and there are some, uh, other, some of the former new towns as well, looking at how they could manage sustainable growth. The advantage of a new, a, a new town is that because it was developed as a new town, often there are opportunities to expand and add to the new town in a sustainable way um, because of, the, because of the, the relative modern nature of some of their facilities. Just now it also is it's the opportunity to invest in um, because it's now come up to 50, 60 years old, you know, there's an opportunity with through growth to invest in the new town and improve it, um, because often they, they do require um, growth as, as time has gone on, require investment as time has gone on. Um, there are a number of other authorities that are looking at, at growth, but it's, it's still an early stage at the moment. We haven't got any formal arrangements. What the, it's, it's an offer there that um, we are working more at the regional level, uh, as I said, with, with uh, the South East England Councils and the East England Local Government Association to think about barriers to delivery, comes back to your point about sustainable growth, that that's only going to happen if we have the investment in infrastructure, hence uh, the identification of these corridors where investment in transport, for example, would unlock growth and would bring forward development that's already planned. Are there the um, willing partners? In, uh, I'm sorry, you wanted to come yeah. in? Yeah, I just, I, I just want to add, um, it was already mentioned at the beginning, um, we are... Uh, we are, we are responding to uh, local plans that are being produced outside, outside London. Our duty to cooperate uh, uh, is discharged by, by responding um, to those plans and um, where there appears to be opportunities we would um, offer in, in our responses to, to those plans um, th some, some cooperation on uh, potential issues related to growth. So if in those local plans we, we would see an opportunity for collaboration, we would, we would pick that up and offer, um, offer specific bilateral meetings. That is beyond um, the, the offer that we have made for collaboration over the last um, year or so to um, that wider South East group. Um, and we have also specifically written the um, offer 
for, uh, for collaboration to willing partners into the plan. So it explicitly says um, in, in policy uh, 2.3, um, in policy SD3, um, that we are uh, making this offer. Are, are, there, are there willing partners? I mean, how enthusiastic is the wider southeast about? Well, um, development. The um, there there is there is some interest, but um, as many authorities um, outside London are struggling to accommodate their their own needs, um, the focus uh, from our perspective is really on um, the, these kind of new settlements. Um, on transport corridors um, and on areas which approach us where there is a genuinely genuine long-term vision to uh, for, for, for growth for an area so that are the, the three the three components so we have the growth towns or the the, the new settlements then we have um, areas where transport capacity is increasing and we have areas where there is political interest in growth of an area over and beyond what they need to uh, grow by uh, in the light of their local requirements. So, so there are parts of the wider South East that, that haven't been overtaken by NIMBYs, is that correct to say? I wouldn't mm. describe anyone as a NIMBY. I think no, people have like very, very found, well-founded reasons for objecting to certain types of. Things. <laughs> but there are there are areas that see the benefits of growth and pl of planned growth, mm. um, and are working together with neighbours to plan that strategically. To what degree do you think some of the issues that they, mm. the, the wider South East has with development would be resolved by uh, perhaps London presenting a transport plan? In, ad in advance of uh, making any suggestions? Is that something that you think could be helpful? A transport plan for the whole of the South East? Or uh, a transport plan a transport that benefits plan the, the people that you're talking to. I mean, do, do you think that's, that's something that... I think well, I mean, um, what, what we have in, in the plan is in figure... Um, I think it's 2.16, it's, it's the diagram uh, that shows um, the initial um, infrastructure investment priorities that were agreed with our wider South East partners. Now, um, those infrastructure priorities were agreed, as, as Darren said, um, not not as the basis for uh, then accommodating additional growth. They were, they were re th those were identified um, to understand where or to highlight where there is an infrastructure deficit that we jointly want to address. Um, so to some extent that's not a transport plan but it is a diagram that shows for the wider South East um, infrastructure and in particular transport priorities in terms of investment requirement. So to what extent would the GLA lend its weight behind transport improvements outside the GLA boundary? I think the offer there is that the Mayor would support the lobby where it's sustainable infrastructure that supported the, the mayor's transport strategy. I think the mayor would support that lobbying as part of seeing the South East, London and the South East as part of one region and working, you know, the economies are linked, um, isn't just about economic growth in London, but it's also about economic growth outside London, which is supporting a lot of that. There is, they're connected and the growth outside London is connected with growth inside London. So I think the mayor would support um, those schemes outside London where there is a benefit to London and it meets the aims of the transport strategy. Perhaps I could ask a wider field <laughs> whether or not you think the willing partners are there 
to support uh, an expansion of development. Uh, Ms. Swain. I think there are um, uh, risks in what I would describe as a bottom-up uh, deal-making um, uh, philosophy. Uh, yes, I think there will be some, uh, some willing partners, but it will come at a cost um, uh, in terms of um, uh, people's faith in the, uh, in the system. Um, there's no uh, guarantee that they will be uh, in the most sustainable locations. Um, yes, I think there will be some uh, that are on the transport corridors, uh, the growth corridors that, uh, that, that have been identified. But from a technical point of view, um, a, a, a more logical approach would have some top-down as well as uh, bottom-up. Uh, planning, and uh, I think uh, the uh, the idea that uh, that that you've just uh, put in about um, uh, a wider transport plan would be an element uh, of uh, of a wider look at the way that London and the wider South East functions. Um, where there would be uh, benefits to uh, the overall economy uh, in uh, providing. Uh, extra connectivity. I mean, who and, and um, a, a good look at options for, for growth. I mean, who knows, for example, that um, uh, uh, making the most of uh, Reading's potential, uh, having uh, had a lot of um, uh, transport investment from from network rail, so that it's uh, very much um, 360 degrees uh, connected now, not just to uh, to London. Who knows that putting a lot more uh, development there might not be um, uh, as good, if not better, than dispersing uh, uh, more growth to um, uh, willing partners. Can I just confirm that those willing partners, the people you're talking to, they're at district council, county council level as well? Both, or is it predominantly? They have to be district council level because only the district council is the local planning authority, right. and actually the strategic planning authority. Right. That is an I that's an issue that we have to bear in mind in terms of Mayor's relationship with the wider South East. Yeah. We're dealing with about 130 strategic planning authorities. Yeah. Um, just to, to point out on the transport no planning authorities, no strategic planning authorities. Each district council and borough is a strategic planning authority according to the Act and the MPPF. Okay. Whatever we may think about that as planners or as technically, right. that's who we have to, that's who has a duty to cooperate with us, that's who has the duty to meet housing needs and to plan, um, and later then people plan with strategic policies and their local plans. Just on the, the transport side, what we do have outside London now though is there are now sub-national transport bodies being set up, so there is an organisation called Transport for the South East, there's an equivalent one for the East of England and one for um, the, what is it called again? Yeah. Part of England. Economic heartland. Economic heartland. So, it, but they're still at a very early days. So there will be um, some uh, an organisation that will be looking at transport more strategically. Now, at the moment, outside London, transport remains a strategic function for the county council, where there are county councils. So there is a division there between the planning authority and the transport authority in some some places. So this could be uh, it could give an opportunity working with a, a more, more than local body that will have that strategic view across um, their region in terms of transport. So could you repeat what are these bodies called? Well, the former <coughs> is, is sub-national transport bodies and the one that has been set up is Transport for the South East and there's, what is it, the Transport well, for the East? Or? Then there's uh, Transport for the East which is uh, not properly established yet but sort of it's in the making um, and uh, some, somewhere in the middle, in terms of its emergence, is the uh, is the economic heartlands, which sort of basically sit, sits between them. Um, may, maybe just to say that uh, we, uh, the wider southeast partnership, has invited um, the three uh, subnational transport bodies to come to our next wider southeast political steering group on the twenty first. Um, of March, and that is because we, we do recognize them as a uh, potential partner in promoting um, those um, transport, those infrastructure priorities uh, that, that we are uh, promoting jointly with, with partners um, outside London. So they are an ally, as are potentially 
the, the um, local enterprise partnerships, as are potentially the counties. Um, so it's not only the districts that we are talking about, but I mean they are at the heart of the delivery uh, of growth in the end. Can I just ask the, these these um, uh, I mean these the statutory authorities, these transport authorities, and what powers do they have? Are they are they passenger transport executives? What? That's still emerging. They're part of the, the devolution deals. Yeah. Um, so I think they're for areas that don't have combined authorities or, or metro mayors. So they would have, I think the idea is eventually they'd have similar powers as, as what the combined authorities and the metro mayors are looking to have in terms of dealing with strategic transport issues. So that's a step forward, isn't yeah. it? In this mess that we've got yeah. at the southeast. Um, can I just ask one thing? When did, when did counties stop having planning powers? 2004, Planning Policy Purchase Act. Sorry? The Planning Policy Purchase Act, when structure plans were abolished, um, we replaced that two-tier structure with the two-tier structure with regions and so local yeah. development frameworks. So this is all, all these developments are quite current actually, aren't they? Because one of the things I was going to ask you is if you can point me to a specific example of where any development has been assisted by <coughs> cooperation with the wider South East. I think we're still in the, it's, it's still early days because, as I said, we've only, we've only been taking this approach for about a year, and it's been around. Some of the work's been around that barriers to delivery and and, and looking at schemes that haven't happened because of a lack of infrastructure, similar to to the Oliver Letwin review in terms of why yeah. developers haven't made a start on sites. But I can remember having conversations some years ago about you know the, our relationship with the wider southeast, um, and we can't point to a single thing where it's had any difference made any difference? Single development where communication with, between the GLA and Essex, Kent or Surrey has what, enabled what the development to take place? It's happening in Essex actually, isn't it? Well, that's what I want. I want, a, I want an example. Yeah. Please, please. Maybe, maybe not. Conversations with Essex, we understand. <laughs> no? What, what I could say is that um, a housing and infrastructure fund. There, there was a call by government to uh, l last year to uh, um, to bid for for money from 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 that fund. And what we did, we uh, um, we cooperated or we, we, we supported across the boundary some some of the, the the bids for funding for for growth um, outside London. Um, so that that's one one you element. Name a particular one. I mean, uh, just one so. one one particular one. Um, uh, there was, um, for for example, a, um, a a bit for uh, re related to um, potential new settlements in in the South Surrey area. Um, and then one in the Watford area. All right, so, so there, there, there is something. Perhaps, perhaps if you could write just later. There is a list. We, we can, I mean, oh, they were only announced a couple of weeks ago. We, we can provide a list of those of, of of the successful bids and what we did. Because we've been talking about this for years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, it, and to, um, to be fair, we were, we were able to very quickly help support those bids. And it was because of this relationship we built up that we were able to contact the relevant boroughs and help them put and, and support the bids for the HIF, which I think helped make the case for um, the investment that the government's made. Lovely. Martin, yes, you, you wanted chair. to come in, didn't you? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, just addressing the issue of where in the wider southeast there might be uh, willing partners or areas that um, could see growth. Um, all my experience suggests that uh, we need to focus on the outer parts of the wider southeast rather than the inner parts closer to London. And the reason I say that uh, is, uh, Andrew, I think you mentioned NIMBY authorities, but I don't, uh, I take a different view about it, having studied some of the local plans that have been prepared in the uh, areas around London, closer to London, uh, Green Belt districts and so on. Uh, it seems to me the conclusion you draw uh, is that they are, to all intents and purposes, full up 
in terms of infrastructure capacity. They really do lack um, any transport, social services, education, NHS capacity, water supply, a whole range of physical and social infrastructures. Uh, a lot of the, or several of the hospitals have been in and out of, hospital trusts have been in and out of special measures. I mean, that's just one example and so on. Um, so I think that the attitude which they adopt or would adopt were there to be a suggestion of still further growth coming out of London, I would think would be hostile and I'd be very surprised uh, if any of those authorities in the ring uh, around London would be willing partners. In the outer metropolitan area? Yes. Yeah. But That's go further out, out, go further out to the wing yeah. 50 to 60 miles from London, yeah. and I think you've got a different situation. And I think you've, um, you know, my GLA colleagues already touched on it. Uh, you've got the Cambridge, Milton Keynes, Oxford Arc being advanced by the National Infrastructure Commission, endorsed by the government. Uh, you've got, as I think was already mentioned, uh, a considerable number of new communities planned, garden towns or garden villages and so on in that outer area. Essex was mentioned, you know, I think, and certainly. Uh, I think that area, when we've got the uh, London Stansted Cambridge corridor, I think very active uh, in pursuing initiatives in that direction, northeast from London. And I think that's well worth pursuing in terms of where there might be willing partners uh, for longer term. Uh, if we can address a situation or clarify a situation, which I think may come out of your question three, as to what the scale of requirement uh, of people moving out of London on such areas might be. Uh, but certainly I think in, uh, in the outer areas, and it relates to the uh, strategic infrastructure priorities in uh, figure 216, um, or 2.15, is it? Uh, 2.15. Uh, as to where, um, the, the, you know, the, how, those, how that relates to transport infrastructure and capacity in those areas. But I think one of the great advantages, uh, or there's two or three advantages in looking at the areas further out from London, are that you can plan in that area uh, the relationship between uh, development and infrastructure uh, very much more easily than you can in inner areas. Uh, you can also relate development much more um, constructively, it seems to me, uh, between housing and economic development and growth uh, in areas like that to create very much more of a, uh, uh, a polycentric structured region, a region where uh, development's not reliant in terms of employment uh, on um, commuting into London. And I think that would be very beneficial both to those outer areas uh, and to London itself with its uh, restricted transport capacity. As an example, so you're saying probably <coughs> having conversations with Broxbourne might be a bad idea because it's our direct neighbour, but it's better to have conversations with Harlow and Bishop Stortford who are further away. Would that be the kind of... I'd go further out well, from Broxbourne, further. actually. Oh, think, yeah, I'm saying yes, Broxbourne I mean, is I've, too uh, close. I've looked at Broxbourne's yeah. local yeah. plan, actually, interestingly yeah. enough, uh, where there has been some uh, very carefully considered um, redrawing of the Greenbelt boundary to accommodate their housing requirements. Uh, but no, I'd go sort of out to Harlow and areas further out from Harlow. That's what I was getting at. And have we, <coughs> to the GLA team, are we talking to people like Harlow and Bishop Stortford? Are, are we having conversations with them? There are conversations, yes. Yeah. Yes, with, with other authorities out North Essex. That, that, that kind of distance. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. it is an interesting observation that actually we should skip a bit before we, uh, and, and that's more fertile territory for future developments. Um, an interesting view. Thank you. There, there are, for example, also um, uh, growth community um, ambitions in, in North Essex. So again, re recent um, uh, re recent local plan uh, consultations where we uh, uh, where, where we responded um, by by offering uh, potential collaboration if there's interest. Kind of skip Thurrock and go a bit further than that. Yeah. Okay.
a lot of people want to skip No one else has got any Corinne, do you want to comment on this or not? Otherwise, we'll go on to our next question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, if, <laughs> with this question, I, I could start with our non-GLA guests uh, first of all, so uh, Martin and Corinne. Um, uh, do you accept the plan's projection for an outflow from London of around 75,000 people a year? Well, is that addressed to you? Uh, I mean, Ben, I think, is probably uh, maybe the best person to come in initially. initially. I mean, I'd, okay. I'd yeah, like to I'd say like to bring in Ben first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, we, we as, I, as I mentioned earlier, our projections are based upon what has happened in the past mm. and those trends. Uh, migration is based upon uh, past observed or estimated propensities to move by um, so for example in our model if you are in local authority a um, and you have an age and uh, of, of 40 and the sex of male uh, we have a probability of you moving to any other authority and so that and it's all based on what has happened in the past mm. um, the flows out of London um, have varied <laughs> over the last decade, and we are basing our projected flows and migration patterns on effectively an average of what has happened over the last 10 years in terms of propensities. Uh, in that context, 75,000 a year, uh, which it was the, the average net flow between London, net outflow between London and the wider South East um, looks reasonable. Uh, it has been higher in the past. Um, immediately following the financial crisis, it was very much less. Um, there was a significant fall in the propensity to move uh, within the country. So um, in 2000, the year to mid-2009, that, that number came down to 45,000. A year um, back in 2004, that number was was almost 90,000. So 75,000 in the context of the last 15 years, um, certainly, and and the evidence is the data is less good going further back, but 75,000 is consistent with what we've seen in the past. Um, yep, Corinne. I, I agree with that, um, uh, and um, uh, I genuinely agree with looking at longer-term trends. Um, uh, as I understand it, um, uh, ONS that do the official um, projections um, tend to look at five years' worth, and we have a dis uh, unless things have changed um, uh, since I last had discussions, we have a major discontinuity. Uh, in that uh, the district authorities uh, are planning uh, on ONS projections beyond the London boundary. And when uh, in the Outer London Commission uh, we were uh, thinking about um, uh, arrangements for regional coordination and recommending to, uh, to the last mayor, uh, we were hoping uh, that there would be um, uh, chances for um, uh, an agreement on a common evidence base, including projections, uh, and I'm not sure whether we're getting there or not. Yep. So, so on that point, part of our engagement with the wider southeast, um, one of the things we did, we built a model um, over the last few years, which explicitly um, works over the whole country. Our older model didn't didn't do that, um, and now one of the outputs we put we produce alongside the, the projections for London are consistent projections for the wider southeast, local authorities in the wider southeast, and for England, local authorities as a whole, and even for Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales as, as bodies in their own right. Um, so we put that, that data out. That was um, the process of putting that information out. We went through a very long period of engagement with our neighbours to make sure they were satisfied. We held workshops where we took them through the model. We had the model validated by University of Southampton, Centre of Population Change, um, and we put those numbers out into the public realm to help inform other authorities around us of what, what the implications are if you take London's assumptions. Um, as it happens, when we actually looked at these numbers, so we produce projections on the five-year basis, like ONS, 10 years, which is our preferred option, and 15 years. 
And one of the things we see is that, that London's growth changes really quite a lot, depending which of those periods you use of past data. But... Say how. Um, hold on, I will just uh, give me one moment. So we do have a document up uh, on the London data store which, which looks at this. So I think the range for London between our short and our long uh, in terms of annualised household growth, um, so that's the number that's in front of me, that our short would, get, would have given 54,000 a year, whereas our long would be as low as 46,000 a year. So it has quite a large impact. I have um, that. Uh, I have a copy of that document. If you, if you would like to see it, so that's on that's on our website. And it's basically part of our engagement with the wider southeast. Um, basically, an explanation of those outputs and the comparison between um, the the government projections and our own projections. Yeah. Um, so there is quite a big difference there for London. But what's very interesting we found is that the the total growth. Uh, that you see in the wider southeast and the east regions, the differences are negligible when you, you apply the same approach. And that was a surprise to many. It was something of a surprise to ourselves until we built the model and, and ran it. And the reason for that is, is that though London is a net exporter to the east and the southeast, they in turn are net exporters to the regions bordering them. So when we, we use a, a longer time series, you get... Um, you, you, you make less, put less weight on that period following the financial crisis when, when movement slowed. Um, and so, as well as more people leaving London for those areas, more people are leaving those, you know, the East region for the East Midlands. Um, and the net effect for them as regions is, is very modest. Is that why the population in the rest of the South East um, I hope I'm right about this, but it doesn't seem to me to have gone up I, I think in the same kind of proportion as London has. The, London is experiencing <coughs> the greatest proportional growth of all regions. So yes, they're not keeping pace with London, but, but nowhere is at the moment. And is that because people are leaving or because... <coughs> sorry, I've got a really bad throat. They're not building the homes. Um, it's very hard for me to, to, to put a, a definite reason on it. Um, I think it largely reflects the attractiveness of London relative to other areas would be the, the short answer, but there's obviously many layers of subtlety within that um, about its attractiveness to different groups and its, its attractiveness to international migrants and such. Um, Do you look at people's re reasons for, for moving or are you just simply looking at the numbers? You know, mm -hmm. Can you say, well, this is because they can't afford a place to live or they just want to move to a place with a garden or they've got a new job somewhere else. Do you, do you ever look at that? Um, we don't do a great deal of work looking at that because the data is quite hard to get hold of um, for understanding reasons for people's moves over time. The information we get is published by the Office for National Statistics on migration. It gives us a lot of detail in some ways about age, sex, where from, where to, but not very much about nothing about why or about their household circumstances or their migrant status or anything like this, which makes it a job more challenging. Well, it really is important, it seems to me, for us to understand um, the extent to which the 75,000 uh, movement of Londoners out into the wider southeast uh, is going to lead to an additional demand for new housing uh, in the wider southeast. Now, critical here, and I think Ben's mentioned this, uh, is the relationship between uh, this projected migration flow uh, and that the which local authority, local plans in the wider southeast are already taking into account uh, through their. Uh, ONS-based, DCLG-based um, projections, which they're required, as I say, to, to take into account. Uh, now, you know, that is an issue, in fact, in some of the, at least, uh, examinations into the local plans in the wider region. It certainly came up 
uh, in the area where I live, uh, Maidstone District in Kent, uh, where this was certainly contested uh, at the examination, uh, with the Home Builders Federation in fact coming along and saying uh, that um, the district wasn't in fact uh, its objectively assessed need, in, uh, in the phrase, uh, wasn't taking into account sufficiently the movement of London hours into this district, which is one immediately beyond the London Green Belt. Uh, now, the inspector, in fact, dismissed that on saying there was no evidence, in fact, uh, which the Home Builders Federation had put forward. Uh, but nevertheless, it just illustrates that this is, you know, certainly something that is uh, very important in assessing future housing need and something which, uh, as I say, I think should be clarified much more than it is at present. Yes, I agree. Sorry, yes, <coughs> In, in our efforts uh, to uh, sort of facilitate the consistency of, of, of data um, uh, across the wider southeast, um, we have written into, into the plan policy SD2D, um, the Mayor supports recognition of long-term trends in migration in the development of local plants outside London. This is, we felt, as far as we could go in, in terms of, um, as I say, sort of facilitating um, that, uh, the, that kind of approach with the longer uh, back series. Um, may, maybe also to mention, um, not as part of the statutory plan, but in, in, our, in our green folder of, of diagrams and maps, there is, uh, there is one which... Um, illustrates um, the net domestic migration uh, between London and, and the wider South East per district. So again, we felt a good illustration um, of, um, of those relationships and a good basis for further planning. Sorry? Could you give us the bigger? It's not part of the plan. No, I know. Itself, it's it's um, within <laughs> the, the leaflets, the non-statutory leaflet uh, that was produced alongside the plan. So, uh, I just want to go back to what, to what Martha was saying. You're saying that there, there are authorities who, I mean, so the London plan is assuming this uh, this outflow, but authorities around London aren't taking that into account in their own plans. Is that what you're? Yes, there's the um, objectively assessed need, as it's called. Mm. Uh, does take into account, as it's required to, um, what the Office for National Statistics through the DCLG uh, says uh, they need to, as I say, take into account in preparing their, uh, their local plans. And, you know, I'm just illustrating uh, the case of Maidstone where it was a clear issue which came up at the public examination in 2016 uh, into their local plan. Yes, this, this issue of consistency <laughs> came up uh, the further alteration a lot and we, we tried to address it. So the issue is that, that as we see it, that a longer base than ONS produced is more suitable for strategic planning, uh, especially since uh, the last plan was prepared so close off the back of the uh, financial crisis. And if you took a five-year period there as ONS were, the immediate aftermath of the crisis and projected that forward for 25 years, that gave you a very distorted view of what Britain might look like. Um, to this end, we, we do produce and we produce as much as we, information as we can to make our assumptions and our results transparent. We have also um, very recently um, finally managed to win ONS over. ONS, who will be producing an updated set of subnational projections in late May, have um, partly in response to our various consultation responses and input over the years, have agreed to produce variant projections for the first time, uh, including um, they've suggested that a longer term based projection is, is high on their list of outputs. <coughs> Those won't be available so in May. The ONS are backing um, the London case. They are, they are willing to produce projections more like what London is, is using, a longer, a longer series of past migration projected forwards right. than they currently do. So that's hopeful, isn't it? 
Yes, so, so we're hoping that that will reduce some of these issues. But it'll still be up to individual uh, examining panels at the uh, local plan examination uh, as to uh, which set of projections uh, they, uh, they favour, depending on the uh, uh, representations <coughs> they receive from the Home Builders Federation and others, and the case that the local authority makes. It's a bit of a minefield, I'm afraid. Although um, it, is, it is certainly the case that um, the, the projections that we are producing based on the longer term trends, they are not always uh, producing um, higher household figures for authorities outside London. So there is uh, there, there's sometimes a significant variation just depending on the individual district. Um, so to some extent, authorities outside London don't really need to fear to consider our figures because they may not, um, they, uh, they, they may not necessarily be worse for them in terms of being higher as they may see it. Can I understand that? Sorry, just trying to understand if I understand that. Members, do you understand that? So you're, you're saying that they might like the fact that they need to put in a higher, it might be advantageous well, to them to have to have a higher figure, is that what you're, sorry, is that what you're saying? No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in, in some cases, um, the projections that we are producing yeah. are pro, 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 uh, come out with lower figures, Preferably. lower housing need figures for those areas. Right. So, uh, they prefer them. So they, prefer they them. from right. that perspective, oh, sorry, they you, yeah. may they they may then e even prefer them. But I mean, originally there was the perception, the projections that we we were producing. Um, would result in higher housing need for areas outside London. I'm saying that is not necessarily the case. Not necessarily the case. So, the projections we've produced for London, um, and therefore for the out migration, are based on a longer. Have I understood this? Are based on a longer term trend than the ONS. That's correct. And therefore, um, because we've taken a longer term trend. That's how we've arrived at our 66,000. Yeah? Yes. And uh, the, that 75,000 net migration, out migration. That's correct. Correct. Okay. Got it, members? Okay. I think so. <laughs> it's very complicated. But in fact, you're saying, Corinne, that it's a minefield. Mm -hmm. Yes. How okay. it's interpreted at each individual district in the wider southeast. It's still, still a battleground at the local plan examination. Mm. Yes. Right. And that's because the ONS is trying to get a national methodology, but with some variations, including London. I, I mean, I think it's a great um, step forward uh, that the ONS are going to, uh, to, to produce variant um, projections. Um, uh, it, I don't think it uh, changes the nature of the uh, planning system, the local plan making system, which is adversarial because at each location around the, uh, um, the home counties, um, uh, generally the developers and the Home Builders Federation are trying to up the numbers, which is all part of the pressure that these wider southeast districts feel and therefore why they get um, uh, nervous if they think that uh, they're being asked to accommodate extra London overspill. Mm, interesting. Aaron and Martin, you want to come in, and then we must move on to the next question. Just quickly, just to make a distinction, because you compare, you're comparing London with the District Council, I think that's slightly unfair, and it, it's slightly one of the issues we have, in that our SHMAR, the Street Housing Market Assessment, is done on a London-wide basis. It does, not, it does not distribute that need to the individual boroughs. So that London-wide need is then um, married up with the SHLA, which is our capacity, yeah. and that's what drives the distribution of housing targets for the boroughs. It is not just about housing need. It's slightly different that the, the, the districts outside London have a slightly different, um, I was going to say problem, but, uh, but sort of challenge in that, that they are expected individually to plan for housing growth at a district level. 
Now, we can produce those, but as I understand, that 75,000, it's important to remember, those 75,000 net migration figures is going out into the wider southeast. Now, whilst we can, we have produced um, where the flows go to district level, that again is, is a past projection. That doesn't have to be how it could happen, and that's not how we plan within London. What we have a difficulty there, outside London, we can't, we don't have an organisation to plan with that's more than local. So I'd just, just be cautious, and I, I have some sympathy, sympathy what Corinne is saying, in that don't compare a region like London or a strategic city like London, where we are planning for 30, 35 planning authorities, with a district council outside London. You know, we are planning, our projections are based on the eight and a half million people. Those projections might be based on a, you know, 100,000 100, people. So I think there is a... Uh, so what the point I'm making is that you, that, that 75,000 is, is the number of people leaving London and going out into the wider South East. It doesn't mean that they're all any going part of the to, to any part of the wider South East. And what we can do in London is we can plan for our need and we can allocate that housing need to the boroughs which have capacity. There's a slightly different challenge outside London in their ability to do that. Obviously, there's encouragement to do joint working. There's new issues around statement of common ground. Which are still at their, in, their, in their infancy, but there isn't the same um, mechanism or structure outside London um, that allows us to do the things we're doing through this demography, mm -hmm. um, yeah. through our demographers. That's really interesting. Really interesting. Okay, Ma Martin, you wanted to come in on this question, and then we'll. Yes, I just wanted to follow Darren actually uh, in what he's just said. I think it's very important to recognise. Uh, that the planning systems, in fact, in London and in the wider South East are totally asymmetrical. Uh, you know, it's something that um, uh, we've had uh, to face up to, certainly since the county councils uh, ceased to be planning authorities. Um, and it does put the onus on the interregional mechanism, uh, you know, which I'm, ple I'm, I'm glad to see is now being str has, is strengthened up from that it was under previous mayors. And it was good to see that uh, Sadiq Khan came to the summit uh, at the end of January. Uh, I mean, we never saw Boris Johnson or Ken Livingstone taking as much interest in this inter-regional relationship uh, as it seems that we now have. Question, of course, going forward, uh, is, is the mechanism as it's currently set up going to prove uh, sufficiently strong uh, to deal with these wide, big issues that we've been talking about uh, this afternoon. And I would certainly hope uh, that over time it does get strengthened. Uh, I mean, I would certainly advocate, from my experience, that it does need a central, um, a bit of a central organisation, and it needs a budget uh, to enable research to be commissioned. I think those are two crucial added dimensions that need to be added uh, added to it. Something like, a, well, I mean, there's, we've got LEPs all over the place, something like a super LEP, perhaps, <laughs> well, be, because there's yeah. seven LEPs operating in the southeast, why not? Just no, I think it needs to be something that's ad hoc and tailored to the particular set of issues which uh, London faces in dealing with and interacting with. Uh, the wider region. Martin, you're saying it should be ad hoc? Pardon? Did you say it should be ad hoc? Sorry? Ad hoc. Did you say it should be ad, ad hoc? Yes, I, well, what I mean by that is something that's tailored to the specific circumstances of the relationship between London and the wider region. So not a statutory mechanism, even if it's advisory? Well, I mean, yeah, statutory, of course, would need to be set up by the government and Certainly, the government to date has shown no interest uh, in uh, there being a, a statutory body for wider southeast regional planning. Right, okay. We're coming on to this again a bit later. Um, Susan. Okay. Um, this is to all of you, or any of you that would like to answer. To, to what extent will authorities in the wider southeast be willing to take into account specific London needs? But I, that I mean, housing types, affordability, and their plans. Right now, <laughs> all of you at once. I can't go. Who who would like to take that on first? 
I think it um, it goes back to, uh, to to some of the things that, uh, that that we've previously been saying uh, that there isn't an incentive uh, for those local authorities to open their doors and um, uh, uh, work with uh, the, the GLA and uh, uh, TFL unless they think they're getting something back from it. Um, in addition, uh, there are very few uh, levers that, um, uh, that, that would allow them to take account of specific housing types and needs coming from, from London because that's difficult in the, uh, the, the, the planning system as well. So I think we're back to um, if, if there are willing partners then these would no doubt be a component of the uh, negotiations taking place uh, but we're we're not in a position um, as in the past when there were um, a GLC out of town or out county uh, estates and things that you know it was all within your powers to uh, to, to assemble the land and um, uh, nominate um, uh, residents to uh, uh, to occupy the housing. Those days are gone. Um, yeah, and just a, a building up point as the mayor through the London plan set out, he wants to make sure flat housing in London is affordable to, to everyone. So, in terms of the affordability point, I think what we want to get to a position is people aren't being forced out of London because they can't afford properties in London. I mean, that's clear through the plan, through um, you know the requirements around genuinely affordable housing and the split between London living rent, affordable rent, and, and London shared ownership. We want to make sure people who need to live and work in London can do that, can afford to do that, and don't need to move out to potentially cheaper areas. So the plan and the policies there certainly are making sure we don't explore any kind of affordability issues outside to the wider South East, and it's very much geared to make sure we're meeting London's needs. And we know from the Shema that there is a significant need for affordable housing and in terms of the, the makeup of that need in London. Can I just come in... I mean, just, just, Darren, how many people currently commute into London? Six, is it 700,000? It used to be 800,000. It's something like seven. It, I mean, the figure that pops in my life, I, I think it's about 700,000 every day, but I, I, I couldn't be... So it's gone down? I wouldn't like to say that's the actual figure. Ben, do you know the answer? I do not know the figure. The, the number, the ballpark of a million is, is the number I have in my head, but it's not my particular area. That might be central London, so it might, it might be 700,000 yeah. to Kaz, yeah. but of course then there is movement between outer London and the wider South East. Yeah, just because oh, I, yeah. I think looking at commuter flows is quite interesting, isn't it? There are, I mean, th there are statistics around that. I know, I know the TfL publish yes. as, as part of the transport, their transport in London report those kind of figures. I think, I think it might be the mayor's transport strategy. Martin? He, if my memory serves me, 700,000 <coughs> that Darren mentioned is rail commuting into central London. And not into the whole of London? Yeah. No, I mean there'd be a lot of car commuting, of course, coming into outer London centre. <coughs> <coughs> road, road commuting. Yes. Can, we, can we get some stats on this? Could you write yeah. to us? Well, yep. we have the so we have the road commuting and the tra public transport committee figures. Could we? Yes. Yawn. We would do that. Well, what what, what we have, and that is uh, that is um, a figure that's that's in the plan, two point thirteen, um, is um, a map that or diagram that shows uh, commuting flows. Um, uh, or the scale of commuting flows into the districts around around London. I'll share that with you, and you will see um, that um, in terms of the scale, th there are there are districts around London where the, the commuting flow is in in the region of fifteen thousand per day. That's in the in the nearest districts uh, around London. We can obviously I expand on that and provide you with, uh, with, with, with other data that goes beyond this. This is based on the 2011 census. If you would compare that with um, the same, uh, if you want, would want to do the same diagram based on the 2001 census, 
you would see that in 2011 there's more dark green, i.e. The, uh, the, the commuting flow uh, has, has increased in, in scale. So I have a figure here from paragraph 2.2.3. 800,000 commuters travel into London each day. That's 800, yeah. um, it doesn't say whether that is a net or gross figure, though. But that, that's, how many, that's the figure we have in the, in the plan. And that's into the ho that, sorry, that's public. It's into the whole of London. Whole of London. So that's road and public transport. Yeah, work all modes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. That doesn't sound Soon. right. That doesn't sound like a lot. It looks like a lot when you're on the <laughs> when yeah, you're on the train. Like lot, yeah. okay, going back to the uh, question I asked you before, I mean, what what do you think the wider southeast are going to? Uh, do you think they'll take into account arrangements for treating and disposing of waste? as well as recycling industries. Do you think they'll look at that with the movement? So we do have um, slightly more, uh, slightly different arrangements for that. So there are, um, re still are regional um, bodies, uh, which are groupings, because that's still a, a county function. Um, there are, there's what's called the RTUB, I think it's the Regional Technical Advisory Boards, um, which deal with waste, and CEREL, it used to be called CEREL, but South East Regional Aggregates Working Party, which deals with minerals. So we have um, presented to those groups and we have um, shared with them all the data around waste and aggregates arisings and they have responded to the London plan. Um, the, the, the plan proposal is that we are net self-sufficient, so that doesn't mean that we don't export or import waste, but that we have enough capacity in London to meet the amount of waste that we produce. But because we can't have all the waste facilities within London, there will need to be movement of waste between London and the wider South East. But in net terms, we will be able to deal with all the waste that London produces by 2026. Sorry, by 2026. And you think that the wider South East will take that into account? In, in yes, which is one of the reasons why we go around, we, we've consulted with them on what the, 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 the sort of figures that underpin the plan in terms of waste movement and particularly types of waste, because they then have to factor that into their waste and minerals local plans. Okay. And I think the London plan says something about substituting some of the businesses within London outside for... Yeah, do you want to um, economic? Yes, that is, um, th that is something that we are considering as um, one of the options for collaboration with partners outside London. So it's, it's one of these offers to potential willing partners that kind of uh, substitution. So um, industry, for example, an industrial use uh, that cannot be accommodated with, with, within London, um, industrial use that wants to expand, something like that, that, that could be uh, substituted outside London um, if, if there is an interest. What have you got in mind, actually, sorry? What, what I mean, because... A lot of London industry needs to be where it is because it's serving London. You know, I mean, it's, sorry, it's very yeah. like just in time food production or repairing lifts or what you know. So, there is, so if you look on the, the, the evidence around industrial capacity, for example, we did as part of that study look at industrial demand and supply just outside London because generally that is radial rather than orbital. So the industrial uses or industrial demand tends to be around the four quadrants, so particularly around Heathrow to the South Gatway at the north, will be the distribution hubs in the Midlands and the east of the ports. And so there's a relationship between London and the immediate boroughs in terms of th there is a corridor right. in, with the M25 being sort of the link around there. So the, at, and as part of that work, we did look at whether you could substitute some of that from London outside. And it, in its mix, yes, some, some occupiers want to be in London because they want to be able to serve the central London market, but some do see a benefit in being, it, they, they could be either in or out, they could be in out of London or in the wider South East because they're a distribution hub that just needs access to road and rail or the ports. But that shouldn't be, it's not meant to be in conflict with um, our, our policy to retain in industrial lands uh, generally because of um, the, the, the significant releases we, we have had in the past and are still experiencing. So um, there shouldn't be a conflict between this potential opportunity for relocation or substitution and um, the, the need to protect, uh, in particular, our strategic industrial land within London. 
thinking, um, could you explain what a consolidation hub is? Now you just mentioned um, consolidation or your well, well, I, I, there is, um, well, it's where you can consolidate, particularly around logistics, will consolidate around um, a, a set of warehouses so that um, all of the, the products can come to one place and then they can be distributed around, in, generally in smaller vans, to the more the local it, needs. Okay. So the HGVs all by, if it's by rail, you know, the railhead, then they're unloaded and then smaller lorries or vans can then distribute in the immediate area. So it takes HGVs up the, away from the need to, to come into So you think the logistics time. in consolidation yes. helps yes. could be something there is some be, there is yeah there could is could be some something that's outside London but serving London and serving a wider area. Yes it could. Could. Okay. And that's what you mean that's one of the examples that, that's of one example of the kind of uh, uh, substitution. Yeah. Okay. Does this seem feasible to other members of the panel? <coughs> some of these really what we're talking about is other ways that the wider southeast could be helping London, really, aren't we? Corinne, Martin. I think um, uh, uh, wider southeast authorities uh, are often interested in extra jobs. Um, the type of jobs is probably important to them. Uh, if there were some um, high-paid office jobs uh, on offer, they would probably uh, be happier than uh, than if it was uh, logistics. Um, uh, but it's certainly worth putting it in the mix of sweeteners to talk to willing partners. Yes. Surely, though. So can I? Surely, though, if you if you if you take something that's being done and then add the sweeteners being lots more jobs, etc., you're going to add the cost of doing something, and that's going to be offloaded to the, the customer at the end of the day. I mean, if you have lots of hubs where the HGVs go to and then you've got lots of um, smaller vehicles that are coming in, you're then going to have to have a lot more admin around it and that will put the cost of whatever is in that HGV up. So the cost of living will rise even further for those in London to accommodate something like that. So, it's worth pointing out, I think, Chair, that uh, the employment situation uh, in areas in the wider southeast varies greatly. I mean, you've got on the one hand uh, a place like Reading uh, in the Western Corridor, uh, which is extremely buoyant and where there is a great problem in providing sufficient houses to match employment growth. That was an issue, Corinne, I remember in the uh, southeast plan. Um, Whereas the other side of London, if you look at a place like Medway, uh, in the Thames Gateway, uh, there's an authority, a um, unitary authority in fact, that he's got uh, considerable unemployment uh, and uh, really does need um, more jobs. Uh, you know, I just sort of say there is a contrast in fact between different places in the southeast, and we ought not to think of the wider southeast as homogeneous in that sense. Right. So, have you got just on on Sue's question? Have you got um, have you got uh, expressions of interest for some of these substitutions? <coughs> Darren, you Yeah, you um, I'm 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 afraid the the an the answer is again that we have had initial conversations but they need to be developed they need to be developed further um, but what I what I maybe also want to just say in response to uh, to, to your question about basically some 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 negative consequences of such type of substitution now um, in our economic section in the economic section of the the, the London plan policy e7 F um, sets out in, in economic terms um, opportunity or the, a perspective on uh, collaboration with authorities outside London related mm -hmm. to relocation substitution and that there are criteria in that policy that make clear that this should support more efficient use of land 
full regard to positive and negative implications, uh, a clear, clearly defined strategy for that kind of move. So we, we, we have uh, put criteria into the plan that uh, would mean that this would, should only be done when it's really reasonable and appropriate uh, to, to do. It's just that that was the example you gave, yeah. and therefore um, I was looking I was looking at it as the example mm. you gave. I mean, there might be other examples, but to the sweeteners that it that um, might be required to do some of these swaps or whatever might end up costing Londoners far more in a different way, and so that that is a real um, risk factor in, in my view. I don't know if any assessment's been done. I, I wondered if, um, with your permission, Susie, if we could just move on to the, because we need to move on to the next panel session. just wanted to end by asking you, um, every single major city in the world is now looking at how to have better arrangements with its hinterland. And London has, um, London has a huge, <laughs> it's part of a huge function urban region. And I, I just wonder whether you, to the panel and to Darren really, and to GLA, is whether we've done any thinking about how we could strengthen the formal arrangements with the rest of the South East. What would you want to do? What should, what should we be doing? Are there any moves to do that? Not beyond what I've just said, in terms of the, the work we've been doing, the collaboration arrangements, um, you know, they are developing, they're becoming more robust, but it is a process we need to work with the representatives of the, of the wider South East on, this, on these common issues. And you're trying to set up joint arrangements, are you? We're trying to set up rates where we, we jointly lobby and can jointly support each other. I and mean, the, the, the Housing Infrastructure Fund bids are probably a good example of where yeah. that process is starting to um, produce some outputs in that, you know, we're jointly supporting each other in... Um, you know, dealing with the barriers to delivery and, and bringing forward housing development or other development and, and investing in infrastructure. Right. And uh, Corinne, you want to come in? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I was heartened to, uh, to, to hear the, um, the ideas about extending the uh, political steering group to um, uh, uh, include discussions with subnational transport bodies uh, and possibly uh, NEPs. Uh, I agree with, uh, with Martin um, that having some real independent technical capacity there, some dedicated officers, so that it's not um, somebody from uh, this or organisation and somebody from that authority, um, you know, there are dedicated people thinking about um, London and the wider South East together. I think that would be um, a, a prelude to um, uh, some um, uh, fundamental thinking about the future of the city region, and I don't, I don't see that that is going to come from uh, from from the existing arrangements uh, at the moment. Uh, I think it needs um, a, a consistent look at development capacity and development needs. Uh, some of the techniques that are being used in London uh, could well be extended into the, uh, to the wider southeast, but they are time consuming, they're resource consuming, so it means there's a, a financial resource implication. I think um, uh, central government needs to buy into this, and I think this is one of the mm -hmm. stumbling blocks uh, because I think they perceive. Um, uh, that if the London and the wider South East are even closer together, um, uh, it's a competition to, uh, to, to, to them. But um, I was interested in um, uh, what's happening in Greater Sydney, uh, where the, uh, the state government uh, set up an independent expert commission, uh, and the commissioners were apparently shortlisted by the local authorities, but then uh, appointed by the, uh, the state uh, and I think some of the technical background could be done uh, in that way uh, so that uh, the um, uh, recommendations about uh, growth locations 
um, and a strategy that um, uh, aligns transport uh, infrastructure spending uh, with uh, the location of, uh, of housing and economic growth so that those decisions could be put to politicians in the appropriate way. But I don't see enough progress with the existing arrangements to tackle controversial issues. Lots of progress uh, on barriers to housing and uh, infrastructure priorities, but nothing about the location of, uh, of growth. So I think it, it needs a different approach. It's very helpful, because what you're suggesting is, um, I have had conversations with a woman who's chairing <coughs> the Greater Sydney Commission, and I think, in a sense, it's an advisory body, nevertheless, mm -hmm. but it has got technical expertise. Yes. And I do think that's a very interesting idea that, you know, given that we're, you know, what we really need is proper re regional strategic planning, but if we're not going to get that, which is what the combined authorities are now getting, but if yes. we don't have that, and we're the only, you know, London and its functional urban region is the only area, it's one of the it's a few areas in the country that doesn't have it, but if we're not going to get it, then having the idea of a greater southeast, a wider southeast commission, which has a technical body mm. to do what you know we were mm. we've just been talking about, is a very good idea, I think. Anyway, we should lodge that and hope, Darren, that, that the mayor and you will lobby, we will we'll all lobby for it. Can I just ask one final question, which is just very quickly, because so we must move on to the next one. Is there anything you would want to see these are to our in the London plan, which isn't there in relation to the wider South East? I mean, in terms of policy. Is it there? Is there something that you think is missing? Martin? Well, yes. I mean, I think the <laughs> we have discussed a range of things here. And I think when we look at the, uh, at the transcript, uh, there were a number of points that have emerged this afternoon which uh, would answer your point. <coughs> You know, I think there's a number of contributions that have been made uh, that would, if uh, you know, we go through them, uh, help to strengthen what the London plan is currently saying uh, in policies SD2 and SD3 um, about uh, relations with the wider South East and how they can be improved and how some of the issues, particularly in terms of uh, the possible extra housing demand that uh, London would place on the wider region can be addressed. Uh, but the further point to what Corinne said that I was going to make is, I did mention it before actually, uh, and that is the organisation needs to have resources to enable it to commission research into some of the key issues. I mean, you remember Nikki and Elpac. Uh, LPAC had a research budget, it only had 20 or 22 staff, but it had a research budget uh, to research some of the issues that needed to be included uh, in what was then regional strategic guidance. Uh, and that model, in fact, seems to me to be one that we could go back to and draw some lessons from. Mm. Interesting. Any, <coughs> Corinne, do you want to add anything? Um, I mean, I don't want to, uh, to end by being too controversial. I would have preferred um, uh, more options to be on the table and for uh, Greenbelt not to be uh, closed off because I think um, uh, uh, if the, uh, the mayor had provided leadership uh, in terms of setting out principles for, uh, for strategic Greenbelt release, uh, it would have gone down well with uh, wider southeast authorities who themselves are having to go through that process. But rather than uh, what should be in the London plan, um, if you think about um, exposing some of these issues at the examination in public, if you're influencing the, uh, the panel, if you can get the panel to write something in their report about the need to rethink relations uh, on a much more strategic basis, uh, between London and the, the wider South East and even try and get some discussion about an expert commission or whatever. We've seen last time round how influential the, um, uh, the, the, the panel's comment about the need for wider engagement. I mean, that really spurred action and we, 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 we shouldn't um, uh, uh, diminish the, uh, the progress that, uh, that's been made, but that is a good channel 
for spurring some additional action in the future. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, all right, I, I, won't, I won't comment on the, no. the, the, um, the, the idea about the, you know, the, the green belt because it's not part no. of what the, the plan is doing. It also doesn't seem to be part of what the government is looking at either, going by the consultation from last week. But I want to thank all of you really very much for your contributions and um, they really will help us in giving evidence, I think, at the EIP. So thank you. Good. Thanks for inviting us. And now we're going to have our, our next panel. Get our members. <laughs> All right. Um, before we begin this this next session, I'd like our our guests to introduce themselves. And this is a session just for those who are watching. This is a session um, that's concentrating on the Thames and all the other waterways in London. And it's in order for us to have further evidence which we can use at the examination in public. So would you like to introduce yourself going from left to right? Just a couple of sentences, please. Left. Um, my name is James Trimmer. I'm Director of Planning Environment for the Port of London Authority. Um, we are the statutory port and harbour authority for the tidal river 
uh, from Teddington Lock to the North Sea. Uh, my name is Michael Coop. I'm the former head of planning and regeneration for English Heritage. I'm a member, a committee member of the Planning and Transport Committee of London Forum, and I'm an independent consultant on a pro bono basis so that I can say what I want to say. Uh, I'm Del Brenner from the uh, uh, Readers Network, which I set up about 30 years uh, uh, or more ago. And um, waterways, mainly canals, uh, and of course, in that time, dealing with British waterways, that was quite a mega challenge <laughs> in those days. And with London Plan, go back to 2000, <coughs> the Waterway Steering Group on the drafting of the London Plan. And um, was also on the London Waterways Commission, uh, which uh, was a, a, a lost opportunity <laughs> being a talking shop, but nevertheless it, it did have some, some effect. Thank and you. I set up and managed the London Waterways Freight Group, which had, uh, at least that had some influence. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Just to, just to start off, if I could ask Darren, and you're, you're, Darren and Yorna are with us still. Um, Darren, could you... Could you just... Yeah. Hmm? You yeah. Ask you all. Yes, it's you Darren is with us. Now, Darren's not coming okay, back. Because <laughs> Darren's not coming back. He will come back. In a minute, okay. <laughs> Jorn, could you um, please explain to us what the approach is to um, the Thames and other waterways in the London Plan? Very succinctly. Yes, yes we'll, we'll do. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, so, um, the, the new set of waterways policies in, in the London Plan... Uh, uh, are uh, constructed around sort of four, four themes. We, we have um, a new uh, strategic, um, uh, s strategic policy that looks in a, in a cross-cutting manner uh, around, uh, around all the uh, uh, water waste issues and um, uh, addresses, uh, for, for example, the... Um, uh, the um, Thames policy areas and the Thames strategies and um, the requirement for um, new um, marine spatial strategies that are emerging. Um, and then it looks at uh, two types of uses um, of the waterways. One very significant one is the use for transport, uh, where we are looking at... Um, at passenger transport, at freight transport, and um, at uh, supporting infrastructure around boat yards, for example. And then we are also, in, in a different policy, are looking at the uh, recreational uses of the, the waterways. So we are looking at infrastructure related to moorings, for example, um, slipways, but also um, access alongside and uh, to to the to the water side, and then finally um, we are looking at the protection of the waterways. So we are looking at river restoration. We are looking at the protection of the character. So that is, as as we see, a, a quite a sort of simple structure of the new set of waterways policy with something overall, overall about the strategic role. It's multi, uh, multifaceted um, uh, functions. And then use for transport, use for recreation, but then also, to put it into the context, the need to protect the waterways as well. Right. OK. Um, and when you say you need to protect them, protect them in what way? Well, um, the, the, the use of, of, the, of, of the waterways uh, can uh, necessitate uh, so, some protection as well. So we, we are looking, for example, at that this is quite a, a new policy related to, uh, uh, to, to pollution. So um, looking at, um, at reducing the pollution from... Uh, uh, from the vessels on, on the waterways, uh, but it's also in terms of environmental protection, so I already mentioned river restoration as a, a component there, but also making sure that development is not, um, is not um, uh, 
developing in, in an inappropriate way into the waterways, um, for, for example. And I mentioned the protection of the character so that development alongside the water uh, doesn't, um, uh, doesn't, uh, does not in a negative way, uh, that doesn't harm the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the townscape, the landscape and uh, the, the openness of the character of the waterways. Right. And does your concept of character include use as well, the kind of use? which is all part of the character of the river. Yes, of course. It does, OK. OK, if I could ask um, our panel, I don't know who wants to kick off first, whether, whether you think that um, an opportunity to strengthen the strategic um, value, really, of the river and the canals has been taken. Who should I start with? Who'd like to go first? Everybody's thinking about what they're about to I'm, say. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go first. I, I feel I might have a different answer than at least one of my colleagues on the panel. Um, I mean, we have um, recommended some amendments to the, uh, the, the wording of the strategic policy, which is called SESI 14, um, which for us reflects the mayoral duty uh, to um, promote the use of the river for freight uh, and for passengers and also, in our view, to maximise it, um, which is a theme that we have um, throughout the, uh, the policy as a whole. Um, so you're, you're, you're wanting... The it to be max, the ma maximised um, in terms of the use of the river. And, and so what word? Uh, well, at the moment, it's, um, I think, and if one looks in the water transport policy, um, it's... I think it, sorry, I should tell you here. We're all about wording. Oh, indeed, indeed. Well, increased, okay. I think. It's increased. Okay. Uh, and of course, increased could be from one tonne to two tonnes. Maximised, yes, so is, max maximised is, is, is a greater quantum. But I think outside of that, um, in, in my experience in sort of water and, and, and wharf planning, um, the type of strategic policy there is at I 14 is at is such a, a a high granular level that decisions aren't made on the strategic policies. They are generally supportive policies rather than the detail that come later on in the plan. Um, so in, in, in our view, apart from some wording, it reflects both the, the higher level of the MMO on a, um, a sort of a southeast marine plan and also to the sub-regional level as well. So in that strategic basis, uh, with some amendments, our view is that it is sufficient and appropriate. And given that this plan, this plan has, um, you know, it's meant, if I've got it right, you know, it's something that um, local authorities can cut and paste policies out of, put them straight into their development mm. plans. I've got that right, haven't I, Darren? <laughs> that it's it's been it's been arranged in that sort of way. It's much. It's mu It's more, in my view. I think it's a general view now that now we've all absorbed the plan, that it is more addressed to the boroughs than previous plans have been. Mm -hmm. I can see that. And um, given that, and that there are 15 or more, I'm not quite sure, riparian, um, now talking about mm -hmm. the Thames, riparian boroughs, do you think there's enough there for the boroughs? I think... And you've talked about this strategic high level... Yeah. But you know, a lot of the plan is very detailed for the boroughs. Oh, exactly. But I think mm. I think it's in it, it tends to be, of course, in decision making where the detail and, of course, as you say, the wording is key. Uh, and for that, the main issues tend to be use of the water and the juxtaposition between the water and the land. It being you know the, the terrestrial planning is effectively what the boroughs will use this mostly for. And in that sense, it's the it's the detailed. Uh, policies, as I say, which, which in our view are, are generally good, but with some tweaks we feel uh, as we put in our reps. Actually, for those to be cut and pasted, it would be more appropriate at the borough level than we found previously, where a, a general a duty of conformity uh, allowed the boroughs more scope to interpret policies uh, than at times we felt appropriate. So I think it's in the detail, the fine grain of policy is where it's of most use to the boroughs, which is, uh, as we understand and as you say, it's where it's going to be used. And do you think this plan is a step forward in that way? Uh, I think in that, sense, <coughs> in that sense, yes, there are issues 
uh, in, in particularly um, SI15, which is of, of particular importance uh, to us, which perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll raise later. But generally, um, our view is that um, it is a good set of policies. Okay. Can I ask Michael? Could I just sort of make some rather broader points? Because, um, I mean, I've, I've said some of this before, and I apologise for repeating myself, but um, I think overall the policies in the plan are pretty good. I mean, the, the policies to do with the Thames and the waterway are now distributed through, through the plan, and you have to track them all down to be able to, to, to see what is happening. But it's important um, to realise how lucky London is to have a strategic authority. Um, we've been discussing earlier on this afternoon the problems of not having strategic authorities in the wider southeast. London does have a strategic authority, and it seems to me that the policies in the plan should carry proper authority. Uh, and my problem has been that there are good policies, but they're weakly worded. Uh, and I would want the ex excessive use of the word should, certainly in terms of where policies are important, and the mayor wants the borough, boroughs to do something specific, it should be changed to, to, to must or shall or be required to something a little bit more definite. Um, uh, and it should be backed up also in, in important cases um, by some statement to the effect that where the mayor decides that his policies are being disregarded, uh, that he will intervene. So I'd like to see much more muscularity in terms of of the policies, the implementation of the policies, and the follow-up. Fine, but um, and it has to start, of course, with the with the um, the requiring or the must. Yes. Otherwise, yes. You know, it is open yes. to complete. Um, yes. Well, a bit of a free for all. Um, um, I mean, <coughs> could I just just turn? I, I, I've said this before in the heritage context. We have to look at what's happened on the south bank of the Thames in relation to the World Heritage Sites, and it's, it's worth remembering that all the World Heritage Sites in London have a Thames prospect, for instance, so there is a Thames angle to all of them. Uh, yet, it seems, <coughs> if, you, if you look to see what UNESCO have been saying, and ICOMOS have been saying, that essentially the plan requirements have been disregarded on a fairly regular basis, and it seems to us that the mayor has got to stand in and take a, a tougher view um, because the experience of the last, the implementation of the last plan has not been good. Right. And would, have you got specific examples of where you think the, the um, well, should, should, you don't have to give us them now. Yeah. Well, um, I've, 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 I've sub whether have should, be, should become of, a, a require or a must? Well, I mean, I could, could, could go through the whole. Uh, so I have uh, made some recommendations in I've put, put some comments to Paul and I have made some recommendations there but essentially it's where the mayor has a, an important policy that he wants to be followed he should be careful not to use should which is a very permissive form of words in my opinion uh, I mean I'm prepared to go through and say where should should be taken out I suppose but um, um, I think we'd like that. Yeah. We want to hear that. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, perhaps I'll do that. I'll follow up. Yeah, we'd like that. Mm. Um, I think one of the comments mm. that has been made to me, actually, I should pass this back to Darren, um, about the plan as a whole, that there are too many shoulds. Yeah. And well, yeah, absolutely. As, as been said by quite I a haven't discovered too many musts or being Not just on the Thames, but... Yeah. I mean, right across the plan. This, this is a comment we've made before in other contexts, and I do think, as I say, if, if, if the GLA is a strategic authority and wishes to, 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 to pass down to the boroughs what it wants to happen, it's got to be a, a bit more certain uh, and a bit more authoritative about what it says. Uh, and, and I do think, um, I mean, the boroughs, if, 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 um, if they can get out of something because the policy is weak, and the inducements from a developer are such that uh, it persuades, persuades them that uh, this is something that's worth doing, that's, that's a pity. Mm. Okay. 
and Dell, do you want to come in? I quite quite agree with that. That, that the um, uh, plan seems to have been uh, less less powerful, less authoritative, and uh, it never used to be. But uh, should has has uh, come come into uh, uh, gen general use, and I wonder who it, we, we, whether we should identify uh, precisely who that would benefit. Uh, Londoners, perhaps, or the uh, environment, or whatever, you know what I'm get, getting at. It's, it's, it's the, it, uh, the, the development that is going to benefit. Uh, so that can't be any uh, 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 use of benefit and for the long-term future of the waterways. As far as the... Um, plan is concerned as well, in general, I find it rather chatty rather than authoritative. Uh, chatty is in a way appropriate if it's not just for the specialists to be dealing with, but for the, for the general public and so on. So it needs to be drafted well, and I think the 2004 uh, uh, plan was drafted very well. It wasn't exactly bedtime reading, but it was very, very well put and authoritative as well. We need some decent uh, uh, um, drafting uh, as a specific issue with the, connect, with the uh, uh, plan to uh, uh, make, make it uh, um, much more appropriate and useful in its purpose rather than just being there. Um, as far as the um, Jim's comment about the strategic use, the min uh, maximising freight. I think that's a very important thing. And I don't think this comes over very well in the waterway uh, uh, section, because I think, as I've said in my response, that the strategic importance of the waterways is, uh, the, uh, is, is freight, uh, water transport rather, uh, which is either freight or passenger transport, uh, which is well, what waterways do which Waterway has been doing for centuries and uh, most successfully. And that, that, that is, is then a strategic importance. Um, it can then, more importantly, be related to the economic uh, uh, input and value to London. And that's very important too, uh, because in fact it should have, rather than just being useful and having a trans transport route like having roads and so on, it can actually be, uh, be much more effective and more directly uh, uh, um, uh, re related to the economic value uh, that it can provide to London. And I think this is particularly the case with the canals. The canals are hardly, well not hardly mentioned, they are mentioned, but they're, they're sidelined, quite seriously sidelined. And uh, uh, I, I think that's uh, something that's a, a, a big worry. Uh, there are two or three places where I suggest that, where it talks about the Thames, I su suggest that it should say and canals, which is just straightforward and obvious, mm -hmm. because they have very similar characteristics. The main difference, of course, between the uh, uh, Thames and the canals is the scale, which is not uh, uh, surprising. But uh, as far as importance and strategic importance and uh, 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 a contribution to the economic value, uh, sorry, the, the economy of London, I think is the important thing that's, being, that, that, that's missed. Um, so I'd see, like to see a lot, lot more uh, uh, um, justification and rationalisation uh, rationalization of freight and including on the canals, which are completely uh, dismissed and sidelined. Is it, is it mentioned, actually, freight on the canals? Yes. So it is there. There is a policy. It, it, it is. There isn't a policy. No, it, it's mentioned. Uh, so you mean it's in the text but not in the policy? It's in the text, not the policy. Why, why, Darren? Can I ask you why is that? Why? Because there are hundred miles of canals. They're really important for transport. Why? And we've even got a. I thought we had a freight strategy for water. Why have we not got? If this is correct, why have we not got? Sorry, shouldn't doubt you. Well, the, well, the text builds on the policy. If the policy supports freight on the waterways, and then it's, it's more details given in the text in terms of what that means. I see, which policy are we... I, I, I'm afraid I haven't got it in my fingertips. No. So uh, policy SI15C 
uh, development proposals to facilitate an increase in the amount of freight transported by river should be supported. And then the rest of the policy refers to freight and safeguarded wharves. There are no safeguarded wharves, are there, on canals? No, nothing on the canals is safeguarded in any way at all. It's all up for grabs, and we're losing and losing and losing on the canals. Nothing's been safeguarded or respected, even. So if the policy refers to safeguarded wharves, and there are no safeguarded wharves on the canals, Aaron, then this is something we should... The, the rest of the policy, I mean, that's a general, of course, reference to uh, supporting uh, freight, obviously on the river, as it is in that context. The rest are, are specifically in relation to the treatment of wharves and their use and future development. So in that context, it sort of splits it into a general and then the specific on wharves later on uh, from uh, D onwards in SI15. Um, mm. all, all of the wharves, safeguard wharves are on the river or the uh, tidal tributaries at the moment. Uh, there's two outside of the PLA limits on Bow Creek. The rest are within our limits on the river Deptford Creek or Barking Creek. I'd say they're in very good hands as well. Sorry, uh, you've got to speak up a bit. I'd say they're in very good hands. <coughs> Uh, with the safeguarded wharfs and the, uh, uh, on, on the Thames. But uh, that, that almost puts uh, the canals even more into the shade. Well, it seems to me that this policy is a classic example. I mean, it, it shoulds all the way through. Uh, and if you want to be serious about protecting wharves and so on, you should change the wording. And the wording at the moment is very permissive, in my opinion. That's a, it must be... Clear. The wording for wharves generally is permissible. Well, it's, it is in this particular policy, SI15. Yeah. Every single every single section here, well, nearly all the sections here include the word should, um, which is which is fine. Um, I'm sure they should. Yeah, but we've, we've gone over a should. Yeah, yeah. Let's get over that. But uh, I mean, certainly there is a requirement, for instance, in D, to keep the network of safeguarded wharves under regular review and boroughs must protect, I would suggest, existing locations and identify new locations for additional water and fleet. So it just, it needs toughening up. Yes, I understood that we had very, very strong policies on safeguarding wharves, and now you're making me doubt that. So uh, over to you, Darren, in your... So I, I have yet to meet a developer that considers them permissive. Sorry? I have yet to meet a developer yeah. that considers them permissive, to be honest. Well, but <laughs> but you, you, can, you, can, you can get away with... Uh, no, I understand. I, understand. So I mean, the trouble is that, uh, uh, as we all know, that frontage onto water adds value. And if you're a developer and you've got the opportunity to put something, a, a building alongside water, mm. you, you know, you can see the pound signs. Um, and therefore one needs to be very careful about development, certainly along the Thames. I mean, we've discussed this before. Um, we need to look very carefully at design, and we need to look very carefully at uh, height. I mean, there should be some height restrictions along the, uh, along the Thames. Uh, and wherever these developments take place over valuable water spaces, it seems to me we need to take special, atten special attention to the character of the area and the design that comes through the system. Um, it, it, it just acts axiom axiomatic, in my opinion. I mean, for instance, one of the problems on the Thames, uh, quite apart from the height of the buildings and the canyon effect and all the rest of that, is that we're losing permeability, and it seems to me the public deserve to be able to have access to the edge of the town. Yeah. 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 We've moved yeah. to my question now, so yes. I might as well yes. come in. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, th th we were discussing earlier in the pre-meeting about the, the, the difficulty, you know, that you can't, there's lots of bits of the town there you can't, you can't walk That's along right. the front of. Battersea Power Station Development has the smallest promenade they can get away with. So do you think we need yes, we much need stronger the, policy on we need that? To be very protection. firm, very firm on, um, on what development we allow alongside the Thames and indeed other waterways too, but particularly the Thames with the Thames Pass and the need for public accessibility. Yeah. Especially with dreadful, dreadful buildings which have been thrown up along uh, uh, um, Albert Embankment, I think. I mean, yeah, just absolutely hideous. Well, I mean, there's another issue which isn't for us here but to do with who's occupying. Well, the fact that a lot of the buildings aren't actually occupied is a scandal, but that's 
that's for another committee, it seems to me. But I, you know, it seems some, sometimes it seems like one of the only things that seems to protect the riverfront is where you've got a protected view of St Paul's and they're not allowed to build anything. Uh, and the other importance so. of, of the Thames is, of course, it's a series, I mean, apart from being a recreational asset of itself, I mean, quite apart, I mean, I accept the need for added freight and all the rest of it, but it is a recreational resource of itself and it also supplies a whole uh, series of linked attractions which are due with set piece buildings that you would enjoy the, the view from, from the water or from bridges and so on. Yeah. And I would argue that the Thames actually defines the character of London. It's probably the most important feature uh, um, of, of the capital. Uh, and therefore, we need to protect it. Uh, and certainly, there's a, a requirement in the plan, for instance, for extra views to be, to be looked at. Um, the mayor, I think, is going to ca carry on exploring the need for extra views. And I think there's a requirement also for the boroughs to look at local views. All these things seem to me to be very useful, and they must be promoted strongly uh, and um, have the proper backing in the plan. But I'm going to bring in G GLA uh, uh, to, to respond to, to that. Yes, um, quite, quite, quite a few things. Uh, I'll, I'll start with um, the, the point about the strength of the policies, and um, I, I understand the point about mu must and should. There's some specific thing um, related to the um, to the water freight component. I, I just want to point out um, b because. Um, the, the, the policies in particular related to, to water freight have really been maintained as they have been in the previous plan and there's, uh, or in the, in the current plan. There's one specific sentence I want to read out which is 9.15.6, paragraph 9.15.6. Um, which reads, the redevelopment of self-guarded wharfs should okay, only be accepted if a wharf is no longer viable or capable of being made viable for waterborne freight uses. The only exception to this should be for, the st for a strategic proposal of essential benefit for London which cannot be planned for or delivered on any other site within Greater London. And I think that is possibly as strong as it gets as a requirement uh, for, for redevelopment. For a safeguarded, this is for safeguarded. For a safeguarded wall. That does sound strong. Agreed, members? It's I mean, a paragraph. Yeah. It's not a policy, though, is it? But it's a paragraph. Yeah. And paragraph means nothing. Oh, no, but no, it no. is. It's part, it's part of the plan, so it's a material it is, it is, yes, it is, the, the, the policy is strong, and, and that policy has remained in, in general since the first iteration of, what, of the London what is plan. The policy, the policy yeah. is re worded relatively similarly. Uh, safeguarded wolves should only be used for waterborne freight use, including consolidation centres. The redevelopment of safeguarded wolves for other land uses should only be accepted where the wolf is no longer viable or capable of being made viable. And then see the viability criteria. So there's a reference to the viability criteria, which then includes also that sentence from the supporting text that I read out. So basically, there is a direct link between the policy and um, that, that bit of the supporting text. That, that policy has been tested at uh, appeal on a number of occasions and has found to be uh, a sound and appropriate Good. policy. Good. Why, why, and does that policy apply to, I mean I've been work, worked quite a lot in the past, and so has a planning committee on safeguarded wharves, and um, we've you know, always resisted any, any l diminution in their numbers. But it's not occurred to us before that the safeguarded walls are not on canals. And canals are really, really important oh, for yeah. London's industry. So why do we not have a safeguarded wharf policy for canals? Can I try, can I try to answer that? Yeah. Um, now, uh, we are currently undertaking a safeguarded wolf's review that, um, that looks again at all the 50 wolves on, on the Thames. That's worrying. Why are you doing that? 
um, because the current safeguarding is from 2005. And there was a, you did another review. It we wrote the, a letter to the mayor. Some the, the issue is that the 2013 review that was undertaken wasn't completed, so um, it never it never led to basically the confirmation of um, of the safeguarding. So we, we made it to a recommendation by the mayor to the government. But then that recommendation was never acted upon by, by government. So therefore, we have 2005 um, uh, sa safeguarding directions that are in place for those 50 wolves. We have recommendations to the government from 2013 that were not enacted on. So now we really need to uh, undertake this new wolf's review to um, underpin this new policy, uh, SSI 15. I'm giving this explanation because now I come to the canals. In the preparation to the 2013 uh, wolf's review, um, Consultants URS undertook uh, some um, investigation into, into the demand for water freight. And we explicitly asked them to not only look at the Thames, but also to look at the canals. Um, that work concluded that um, there, there was no, uh, due, due to certain constraints on the canal network related to size, weight and speed of freight. I mean, there are the locks, for example, the, 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 the canals are smaller in size. There are certain restrictions which makes it very much less viable to uh, put um, freight onto the canals. So a few examples were ex uh, explored. It, the, the report says that it works where there's subsidy, but as soon as subsidy recedes, uh, uh, ceases, that operators would go back to the cheaper and faster alternatives of using the road. <coughs> Therefore, um, the, the, the report concluded, I have it here in front of me, that um, it may work in niche cases, but on, on the broader scale, it's more something that should be explored if opportunities arise. And that was what we uh, took as a result from this. Um, and therefore, on that basis, we felt it, it would not be appropriate to consider safeguarding specific wolves on, on the canal in the light of that, uh, in the light of that evidence. Just, can I just ask, because yeah. I'm, I'm quite shocked by what you've told us, um, because for many reasons which I can't go into, but I, I just think, doesn't the industrial demand land supply, um, the demand for industrial land, doesn't that actually talk about the importance of wolves? Because the industry along the canals, I don't know. Can, no, can, can I, I say? I didn't even realise that you'd done this URS report. Okay, can I say about industries along the canal? You look at the uh, uh, Sills match, the, the strategic uh, um, industrial locations. There's quite a lot on the canals. In fact, there were 50, was it 54 um, Sills, and uh, over. 27 of them, I think, about half of them, are on waterways. That's the Thames and the canals. But quite a considerable number of them uh, are on the canals. Specifically... For people who don't know, that's strategic industrial locations, yes. which are on canals. Yes. yes. And this is land we've been hemorrhaging, and the plan is pretty strong on protecting... Well, it's very strong on protecting sill. Yes, yes. Uh, which is not very successful in West, Lo West London on the canals, in the, uh, uh, just outside the Park Royal area where I'm starting up uh, a, a freight uh, project, which will be news to uh, quite a number of people. Yes, Jorn. Um, I, I just want to reiterate that 
uh, the conclusion that was drawn was not that um, this shouldn't happen, that, that there shouldn't be any, any freight on the canals. It was just felt in the light of the evidence from, from URS that it would be um, inappropriate in terms of this, the, the, the potential limits in terms of sort of scale and, and speed and viability to um, designate specific wharfs on the canal network in a similar way as uh, there are sites safeguarded um, on the Thames for freight. We understand the point you're making, um, but I mean, I don't know, I, I, I have to... Tom, you're on the Transport Committee. Does the Transport Committee looked at freight on the canals? Oh, we haven't, but um, I'm hoping the freight's going to be on our uh, work programme for the next year. Uh, but we need, still need to have that discussion. Because there used to be, as far as I remember, there was a, a freight um, strategy for London which did include canals, I thought. We used to have one, I thought. Up to 2008, uh, TfL were actually very actively promoting freight on the canals. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, that was a very active and, and uh, 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 positive uh, route that they were, they were taking. Um, with this business of the, the report that uh, Jorn is, is, is referring to, uh, the, the, it, it's not just a matter of, uh, of a discussion of, uh, of the, the virtues of the canal freight or not. It was actually talking about barriers to freight. That was the tight subtitle of it, Barriers to Freight. And in fact, no wonder the, 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 the potential for freight was, was dismissed altogether when using that sort of uh, language. And I think they were, that's what Peter Brett's uh, um, uh, 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 And uh, I objected very strongly to that at the time, uh, which was watered down slightly, but it was a very negative view rather than taking into account the potential the potential isn't as big as the uh, uh, Thames. Uh, we never pretend, of course, that it is because it's a small waterway. But nevertheless, within its own right, it's, it, it's a very viable and uh, could be very busy freight uh, 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 transport route. And that's why I'm starting up a freight transport uh, 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 project at the moment in Park Royal under the... Yeah, and under the, uh, uh, um, not just the uh, invitation or the interest of, of the industries in Park Royal, the 2,000 industries there, but I'm being pressurised by them. Del, can we get the canals going, please? We need freight on the canals, please. <coughs> I mean, I and and, and we, come, we come up with things yeah, like this, that it, it, there's a barrier for freight. I think we've, the, the, we've got to take this away because yes. um, it's very complicated. We've got a report which is basically subtitled barriers to freight. We need to go back and look at the 2008 study, I think. But I, I, am, I am very concerned by this because everything's moving towards less congestion on the roads, mm. more waterborne freight. Mm. Um, all these, you know, the, we're stopping the hemorrhaging of industrial, strategic industrial locations. And we need to be, you know, and we've got massive building projects, so we need to be using canals for freight. Okay. So, we need to be safeguarding wharves on the canals. I mean, I can see that if you did a straightforward comparison in terms of value for money, it would be cheaper perhaps to take something by, by lorry. Um, but it is still feasible, it seems to me, to, to look at the external benefits of putting freight on canals, even if it, it takes longer uh, and is theoretically a bit more expensive. I mean, you could actually make it a condition of a planning um, uh, a permission as well, couldn't you? you could um, have an arrangement that the that the um, material should be taken away by canal. It is possible to do that. I just just think that if you make a straight financial comparison, that probably isn't good enough because there are other benefits of of taking freight on canals. It could be if you had a, a, a tax on pollution, yes. Um, yes. which in a sense. Yes. What what price the environment? Yes. What <coughs> price the environment? And also. also um, uh, you, you, you say that it's, it's not the, the, the prices of compared with water and road are slowly uh, getting closer and closer and closer and also with road taxes and all the problems on the road and congestion and so on they, they, it's, it's not going to be for very long I don't think before they are fairly even 
So oh. the move is off freight onto residential development along the river. So that's all right. Mm. George, do you want to come in? I'm just keen for us because we've only got about 15 minutes left. And uh, can, I, can I just make chair one 10 second point, uh, which is in response to the the, the barrier call, calling the uh, or titling the um, the the canal freight sections or focusing on the barriers. That was actually not the case and. Uh, following um, consultation, we, we addressed that point and uh, the, the report certainly talks about a range of potential uses. Um, so, therefore, that report struck, struck a balance there and identified individual opportunities, just not in a way that we felt that, on the whole, that would, rec that, that would justify um, safeguarding. I leave it there. Yeah, I, I, would, I have some comments as well from, from, from uh, the planning team on uh, you know the height of buildings along the Thames and uh, and uh, I mean the, the kind of buildings that are being thrown up. I mean I walked past the Shell Centre development the other day, which is just grim. It's bulky. It's the, the massing is appalling, and I just think it should never have been given planning permission. But what what more could be done to to you know, to actually do something to prevent that kind of development. Um, what, what, we, what we have is um, in, in policy, I, I mentioned it briefly at the beginning, in policy SI14, which is the strategic role component, where we talk about um, the, the Thames policy areas, which is um, designated by, by the, the individual local authorities, they designate a stretch along, along, their, uh, a, 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 along the River Thames where um, certain um, River Thames related requirements apply. And one of that is, for example, also that um, the threshold for a proposal becoming a strategic uh, a referable proposal that needs to, to go to the mayor mm -hmm. uh, is, is lower, it's 20, 25 metres compared to, I think mm -hmm. it's 30, outside Thames policy area. So that is, that is a mechanism that we, uh, where, where we uh, sort of provide a framework for the borrowers, they, they, should, they should do this. And then we have the Thames strategies. Um, which um, which are uh, th there are there are three Thames strategies uh, one from Hampton to Kew then from Kew to Chelsea and then uh, uh, Tower Bridge for, uh, to towards the east so um, the and the, the, there are quite detailed strategies for for, for those areas where the local authorities um, have come together and uh, sort of have looked at potential requirements for, um, for, for, for development. And when it's, they, they are material considerations, they, they, are being, they are being quoted when it comes to, uh, to, to planning proposals as uh, things to, to, be, to be considered. And then um, across the plan we have, uh, quite independently from the uh, specific location uh, along the, the water, we have Policies related to design, to tall buildings, to to the views as well, where uh, the waterways uh, are, are a component that needs to be taken into consideration. I can point to specific policy areas if that would be helpful. Um, and what about the ability to, to, to walk along the Thames and requirements there? As I say, you know that's very very patchy. Is the, is this, is the new plan stronger in terms of that than the old plan? It is absolutely absolutely stronger. It is very much stronger and there is a uh, specific policy uh, that uh, component I can point you to and that is um, in policy uh, SI16H, the last point there under that policy, uh, that uh, is very specific, uh, about, specifically about Improving and expanding uh, the Thames path and also the tow path. Is it a should? It's a should. Um, it's a should. Yeah. It should improve. Yeah. We don't call that but strong. It, but it but I mean, 
that may be, and we, we have we have heard your your we have we understand your message on that but generally if you would compare the wording here and the specificity related to uh, what should happen to to improve uh, the ten uh, the Thames path um, in in terms of um, in, in, in terms of re requirements to make that happen. It is a stronger wording than in the current plan. What, why is the reluctance to say must, though? This is the thing. What, 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 is, is what, does, a, what problems does that cause you if you, say, if you say must rather than you should? Is this a job creation programme for planning law? <laughs> because, we, we, are ha we are happy to take, to take that message away, I, I can say. But then I think um, there, there is... There, there is some, there's something more than the, the policy, and I just want to point to that, and I think it's on, on your agenda in terms of the questions anyway, and that is the Thames and Lon London Waterways Forum, which is um, a group that has been set up uh, last year, um, which is an advisory group um, to uh, so advise uh, the, 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 the mayor on, on waterways re related issues. Now, this, um, this new forum is chaired by Val Shawcross, the deputy mayor for, for transport, and uh, she approaches this with, um, with real keenness and, and de dedication. And the idea is um, that we, we have now a, a new structure that includes a, um, a, a steering group with key members from a, a range of organizations and we have three working groups, one related to uh, passenger transport, one to freight and development and one which is called people and places. Now that last working group, one, one of the key tasks for that this group is relatively new, so it's, it's finding its feet, but it's sort of gaining strength and we are looking at work programs. And on that work program is very firmly helping with the implementation of, um, of the Thames Pass and getting, getting that, that uh, expanded. Um, the uh, inaugural um, annual meeting was last July. And um, then there has been... It's less than a year old. It's, it's less than a year old. It's building on, um, the, um, on, on the London Waterways Commission that existed in the past. And we also had a, a group that uh, 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 Thames River Concordat that was about passenger transport. So it's bringing together uh, two uh, organisations that existed under the previous administration and creating a, a new body that we think is sort of more fit for purpose and why more, is more... Why is it more fit for purpose? Because I, I think a structure, the, the, the structure um, is is, um, I think, more, more appropriate with a steering group that sort of oversees across all um, waterways issues uh, what, what needs to be done. I think it is better, and it, it, it appears appropriate in terms of the leadership and through the different working groups with, um, with work programmes that look at a range of areas within planning and beyond um, we we believe that uh, there is um, there there is scope for implementation of, of our wider South East policy. We also feel there's more resource, more officer resource behind it. I think um, we're represented uh, on all the on all of the groups, but I'm on the the freight and development uh, group, uh, of which there has been one meeting so far to consider the London plan when it first came out, and I think the major difference. Uh, between that and the uh, the, the previous uh, setup, notwithstanding there wasn't a specific group for freight, was the major interest of freight operators and the terminals on the river. So it's actually got those who move material and those terminals to which it arrives, rather than um, a, a, a narrower mix of people <coughs> on it. So I think it has um, cast its net wider in terms of who actually is on it and the and the dedicated work programme that's being set up by the membership. So I think it's more focused uh, and 
uh, albeit there's only been one meeting, uh, it will actually get more done. And it's focused on freight as opposed to a, a far wider range of uh, issues. Once it's powers, what, is it, what can it do? It is most certainly from from the freight one. It has nothing statutory. It's effectively it, it, it's it's synergy and partnership in terms of getting things done and advice uh, and and uh, approach to uh, planners within the GLA that a lot of the operators wouldn't have normally. Who does it make recommendations to? It would be to the uh, GLA and also within the group to get things uh, get things done with local authority members on it as well. Does it, can I just ask, does it, does it, um, does it deal with canals? Um, the, the freight aspect? The, the freight aspect, so far the, the members were uh, drawn from the river um, because um, that's where the vast majority, I don't actually know what freight is actually handled on the canals. It, it has a focus on the river. Uh, do you think that could, something where it could be strengthened? Um, potentially, I mean, a, a number of the issues in, in planning terms, at least, are, are broadly comparable. Operationally, they are vastly different, but the issues through planning, in terms of juxtaposition of uses and loss of wharves, are broadly similar. Uh, Published minutes. The yes, secretary. Yes, it does, <laughs> and there is there is a there is a dedicated website where um, where uh, notes of meetings, etc., can be uploaded. You, you asked about. Um, so it's in terms of the, uh, the the structure. So as I said, the deputy mayor for transport is is the chair of the steering group. So uh, basically, re reports go to her, and so uh, the uh, the information are uh, are brought to to the to the mayor team and the, the mayor's office. So if I go onto this website, I'll be able to look at the minutes and I'll be able to see what discussions are taking place. Absolutely. And would things like Enderby Wharf end up being considered by this body? Now, uh, are you referring specifically to the uh, to the air quality issue yeah, quality related issue. to that? Now, um, it was felt that um, air quality is something that is a cross-cutting issue and would therefore be dealt with directly by the steering group. So, for example, we had a, a report to the steering group by the PLA on their draft well, the air quality strategy, air quality strategy recently. So, um, air quality issues would, would go directly to uh, so you, to that you, group. Have you discussed Enderby Wharf on this? <laughs> we, we've had one. Well, the freight and development subgroup has had one meeting which discussed the London plan. So, no, not as yet. Uh, not as yet. Not but, as yet. But it is something that will probably come across your. Air, air quality. Yes, I mean. Well, I mean specifically Enderby Wharf. Uh, Enderby it's Wharf. An interesting. Case. It is indeed. Um, potentially, we certainly we certainly were looking at air quality principally from vessels uh, and, and freight vessels, but it's something uh, in terms of the membership for to, to put forward as an agenda item. Right. And Greenwich uh, has certainly been one of the invited boroughs to attend. Okay, so if Greenwich were reluctant to put Enderby Wharf on the agenda, could somebody else do that? I presume any of the members could suggest uh, any items to be discussed. Presumably, if the, if the group were able to call um, policies forward from the draft plan, that would add weight to the advice that they, they give. So clearly, there's, one isn't a substitute for the other, but they're useful to draw together, it seems to me. I mean, part, part of, again, the freight group, a number of the operators we deal with, their, their job is moving things up and down the river, and therefore strategic planning is something that happens to them that they don't influence. So part of the group, again, is to inform them what the plan is and how they can participate in the process as well. What's the role of the Canal and River Trust? Canal and River. Um, they, they are on the steering group and they are also represented on, um, on, various, on various working groups, people and places and uh, the freight and development group as well. And um, maybe that brings me to a point which is partly also uh, a response uh, to the question from Assemblymember Copley, which is at the last steering group meeting, um, we, we, were, we were tasked with looking at potential examples um, that could uh, sort of showcase, um, give guidance, give case studies, on, give a case study on um, the 
integration between different uses along the water. So that could be um, and the integration and the co-location between potentially residential uses, um, um, freight uses, passenger uses, uh, recreational uses. So we, we were asked to, uh, to come up with examples of good practice related to that kind of integration. And we may look, for example, at one or two opportunity areas and we will sort of carry that forward and that may lead to recommendations that can be applied elsewhere in London. Greenwich Millennium Village being a very good example and their proximity. Right. Greenwich Millennium Village phase two and their proximity to the two very large aggregate wharves in Greenwich and how uh, that juxtaposition has been managed successfully is, a, is the principal uh, example of that and actually developed and delivered through the London Plan policy. Before that, there was no opportunity to become involved in the, the local decision-making process to affect, um, again, these juxtaposition of, of noise and residential uses, which we know we're going to get more of uh, as the city intensifies. So if I can just go back on that. So the Canal and River Trust Limited are members of which body? The, 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 the steering group, the... Um, the Steering group. The, the, the steering group. Which is useful for canal, isn't it? Um, and then the, but also the freight and development and the peoples and places groups. And uh, presumably uh, all members of that steering group, would they have to declare interests in anything to be being discussed? Yeah. Standard local government stuff about declaring interests. Thank you. Uh, could, I, could I just ask a question? Is there any particular reason why the reference to the Blue Ribbon Network in the old plan at 724 doesn't appear in any form in the draft plan? Um, yes. Um, we, we, we felt that... Um, that um, the, 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 term, the term waterways was, was clear and more, 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 more accessible and um, um, in particular for people who may come new um, to, uh, to, to, planning, to planning in London um, more, more, more direct as a term because it, it, says, it says what it is. Um, and therefore, we, we felt that that uh, change was appropriate to make. Why, why, why was it a complete change over? Why couldn't the Blue Ribbon Network uh, term be retained and uh, use of waterways where it wasn't, um, the word waterways, where it wasn't clear enough? Um, I, think, I think there's something, something very worrying about the, the loss of the Blue Ribbon Network um, uh, term. It was... There's definite um, reason somewhere along the line, and I don't think it's a, it, that it was a very advantageous reason. And it certainly wasn't consulted, which is the other thing, because there's a, a great deal of knowledge, affection, and so on. You immediately refer to the Blue Ribbon Network, uh, of, of, about the Blue Ribbon Network, and it actually uh, uh, has, has got very closely involved with the waterways in London. And not what you say, it doesn't cause confusion, so I don't know where you got that from. Um, it, it's something that brings things together, the Thames and the rivers, the canals and the, the docks and the ponds and the reservoirs and so on. It's become a very useful, uh, 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 catchy, uh, in a way. Is it, is it, can I just ask you, is it, is it more than just terminology to describe no, as I was saying, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's certainly very catchy and so on. Waterways is something very mundane and ordinary, but this is something special. This is, it this has is no policy uh, difference, there's no difference in policy, policy between it and waterways, it is just a term. So there's, no, there's no significance in very, policy terms very good for term. it. But, it's no, no, but no planning appeal has been lost on something called the Blue Ribbon Network or not. It might be a nice, as you say, a catch-all reference for the waterways of London, but it has no significance in planning terms. I mean, figure 9-6 is pretty well identical to the figure also in the existing plan called the Blue Ribbon Network. I mean, 
that's fine, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I just wondered whether there was a particular significance of blue ribbon, is and that the loss of it was significant in, in some sense. sense. I mean, if there was no reason, why why remove it? If well, no, I mean, we we, we felt that the the the, the, the term waterways. Um, is, is clearer, m more direct to understand in particular, as I say, for, uh, for, for people who, who may not um, have, have, a, uh, have um, the, 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 the history in, in uh, the, the, the development of, or the understanding of, of the, the, pre the previous plans. The supporting text, 914.1, um, actually explains the, uh, uh, the, the, the characteristics of the waterways. It talks about the network of linked waterways and so on. So therefore, that component is not lost, but in terms of the direct understanding of... Uh, <coughs> we are talking about waterways now, so we, we call it waterways rather than Blue Ribbon Network, which is sort of an artificial... I understand what <coughs> Mr. Brenner is saying, because at the moment, most assembly members are very much pushing for a national park city. Um, if you ask any assembly member exactly what that means, you shrug your shoulders. Um, <laughs> no, absolutely you, no clue. Yeah, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You, you wouldn't be able to pick a particular thing that you would do because somewhere is a national park city. Uh, but it does have a meaning for people, that they think that that actually right. says something yeah. about our city. <coughs> I can understand mm. that um, Mr. Brenner is, feels that we've lost something by losing that terminology of Blue Ribbon Network, and it may be worth considering that. It, this is no reason why it should be expunged completely, mm. because I think <coughs> it, has, it, it has, a, as you say, it has a cachet and uh, some, some mm. sort of relevance in its own right. Uh, and uh, it, particularly in, in, in this uh, period when we're talking about blue-green economy and so on, uh, a reference to blue is, is quite a, a straightforward reference. It's not going to confuse anybody uh, that we call it a blue river network. It's obviously about waterways. Can I, can I say that we've, we've given as much time as we allotted to this part of the session? And I, I'm very aware, though, that there are areas um, of waterways in the River Thames that we haven't dealt with. Um, it would have been good to look at moorings, it would have been good to look at docks, there are a number of other things that would have been good to look at. And I therefore would ask our participants, all three, and thank you so much for participating, that if you have any recommendations for changes of wording or additions or pointing out things that you think are anomalous, do write in to us, um, because we would, in an ideal world, we could have gone on longer, obviously. Um, so I want to encourage you to do that. And I want to thank Darren and Jorn very much for participating right through the meeting and for being so helpful in <laughs> correcting <laughs> us and taking things on board. And um, thank you to the members. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, so okay. can I just ask the committee to note the report and the discussions today? and delegate authority to the chair in consultation with the deputy chairman to agree any output arising from the discussion. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you all very much.